This is episode 181 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Jim Shields. Jim is a real estate investor, best-selling author, and family leader. He's also a partner at Southern Impression Homes, which is a build. They do a lot of build to rent there, which is a lot of what we're going to talk about. He's also a co-owner of 18 Summers, which provides family education services. And he's fused these two in his books, the uh, Passive Income Playbook, Leverage, Build to Rent Real Estate to Buy Back Your Time and Create a Legendary Family Life. Jim, welcome to the show. Jonathan, thanks for having me. Yeah, it was funny. We were just connecting before the call on our locations. We're kind of trading locations. But thinking back, because we were talking about where you grew up, when was the first time that you found yourself interested in real estate? You know, uh, it first became an interest of mine after I had graduated college in Pennsylvania, left the Northeast and moved to California, I took a sales job out there and it fell through. It was miserable. And I went on to this entrepreneurial pursuit, you know, reading everything from yeah. this biz op to this franchise to that. And I kept coming back to real estate. There were a few different books that I read and it just made sense to me. The tangibility, you know, where you and I were, were hop, skip and a jump from Wall Street. I never yeah. liked that world. I didn't understand it. Real estate just made sense. The leverage, the levers you could pull, um, and then just seeing some of the case studies that what people were able to do looking with real estate long term. I, I literally, from from just post college, when I became a good student, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Yeah, that's when I found real estate, and and it was it was by accident, but it kept coming back to me like, oh, this is interesting. Real estate investing, huh? Real estate investing, very interesting, and so it just kept kind of presenting itself to me in different readings. Yeah. The tangibility really resonates with me because uh, growing up, I, I also, I was presented, you know, stocks and real estates as options through, that's what my dad did. And I was looking at stocks and I really had no control over it, but real estate, the tangibility, you can see it, touch it, improve it. And that really, I guess, made me think differently about it. How did you use that knowledge when you started to lock in on real estate to eventually get you into the business? Yeah. You know, people say to me, and I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on my education, mastermind groups. It's one of the best decisions I've ever made. Yeah. And people said, well, what's the best real estate class you ever took? I said, that's easy. 432 North M street by far it's in Marlboro, California, the yeah. first fixer upper don't want her three family home that I bought. Yeah. And, and I'll never forget. I made an offer. They were asking 150. And I offered 152.5 with $2,500 in closing costs. So I gave them full price, but I asked them to do it. Now I had done comps. I knew it was worth like 180, 190. Yeah. And it was a probate sale that an agent had just listed. Don't want her. But still, I remember I offered full price to get some closing costs back. And Jonathan, I'm staying in my rental property in Santa Barbara, California, which is right down the road. Yeah. And I was hyperventilating. Right. Just that it had been accepted. It was the worst news I ever got. Did you have an oh crap moment? Because it's so funny. Yeah. Everyone wants to get into the game, but then when you get that first acceptance, you're like, wait, what did I just do? I'm going to collapse my whole life. Yes. What did you do to get past that? Because I know obviously you did. You know, I was doing a lot of that reading, luckily, and just a lot of people were saying, you're going to feel the fear, but do it anyway. Don't get analysis paralysis. And I talk about that. Do your basic numbers. And sooner or later, you are going to have to take some sort of educated risk. Yeah. And at that age, I literally just had to, uh, you know, Dr. Phil myself and say, you are young, yeah. you have more dependence. Now is the time to starve yourself. It will not end your life. If it does not go well, uh, take the risk and the numbers that you were taught to follow and look for, this was a square peg in a square hole. I think people get uh, the wrong idea if they're not familiar with just traditional residential multifamily. Like there's lots of blocks where I am, where you have a really sweet two family in between. They just looks like a single family. Exactly. You know, and, and, and then there's no like neighborhood angst because, oh, you're putting multifamily. It, it's just a duplex, you know, same as a side by side, one on top of the other. I think that's a really important note because you said that one thing that I always have an issue is there's, when people talk about affordable housing, they're really talking about two separate things. So there's an affordable housing crisis, which they're talking about in general, but it, it's a misnomer because they're thinking affordable housing in terms of just lower volume, lower rent. Affordable housing applies to everybody. And what you're saying now is I can produce a premier product, make it more affordable by turning it into a duplex. 
So that mid-range person who, you know, maybe they do have more money than somebody else, but they still can't buy it or they don't want to buy with a 7%, they can rent a pretty sweet property and maybe they're going to save the money and invest in a different piece of real estate. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I think it's important to uh, a solid duplex, like you said, does not take down the integrity of the neighbor. That's why that the counties allow, you know, you approved in the first place, you're not building a you know, a, a four-story apartment building or something, a residential neighborhood. But I think a big misconception, Jonathan, about build to rent is what they see Wall Street Journal talk about, where it's build to rent means you go in and you're building 250 houses in one neighborhood and the whole thing is rentals. Now, to be clear, we build some of those for some of the larger hedge funds and institutions. Yeah. But what about Main Street? What about individual investors like us? Well, I don't really recommend those. You know, they have their own wallet and their right. own bigger, you know, um, buy boxes and, and, and returns that they look for and how they do it. But for the smaller investors, I was always taught, go to a neighborhood with a good percentage of homeowners to renters. Yeah. That helps with values. It helps normally with the safety of the neighborhood, all sorts of things. So when we're doing build to rent, yes, we'll build whole neighborhoods for sure. But that's the only way for bigger groups. We actually do a lot of what's called infill lots. Yeah. We'll go to an existing neighborhoods and, you know, and a couple square miles and we'll buy up all the in empty lots in an already existing neighborhood with a high percentage of home ownership. And we'll build our single family homes and duplexes in there. So yeah. now you're getting that safety score of homeowners and renters, a good ratio. I don't like to go all investor owned neighborhoods. Uh, it's just been something I was taught by those first mentors and those yeah. first mastermind groups. And so build to rent doesn't have to be whole neighborhoods uh, of just all rentals. It can actually be strategically placed, which we do a lot of for our individual investors. Uh, I wanted to get one thing from you because we were talking about the advice that you've learned, but as someone who's flipped, you know, or renovated thousands of homes for somebody right now in this economic environment who is new and wants to get into flipping. What's a piece of advice that you would give them? Because I'm very leery uh, or, or just, I guess, worried for new flippers now because they just don't think they know what they're doing. You know, construction costs is high. Contract of turnover is extremely high. I worry for them. What advice would you have if they really want to do it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, remember, there there is a difference between entertainment and effectiveness. And the TV shows... <laughs> are are designed to make you want to watch them so struggle big repairs setbacks almost always part of the show heroes and training I know from being here yeah, and and from being on the back side of some involvement around those most of those deals actually lose money oh yeah and they're done for entertainment and so those shows have taught you to take on these big grandiose rehabs that's not how I would start out. Yeah. You know, the old thing of, and I, I can't stand carpet now, but it used to be called, look, find something under value that just means paint and carpet. Yeah. That was great advice. That's how I started. And, yeah. And that, that's what you want to look for. Now, for that said, you will never see in our new construction, any carpet. Yeah. I, if I could go back, I could buy a few houses being clear with the amount I spent on carpet. It's terrible. Yeah. I'm going to flooring, tile, like that. So anyway, but, but again, the old paint and carpet adage, start with a rehab where you're getting a good price. It's ugly. The landscape is crap. Yeah. Maybe it needs just a new roof and paint carpet and, 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 and new, um, uh, new, um, cabinets or something like that. Yeah, a few appliances. Like yeah. You're not, you're not looking for big structural damage. And you're also, and maybe you have a knack for this, but you don't necessarily want to do a high end home. You do a high-end home, you're dealing with high-end buyers. And they yeah, might exactly. Be here, did you know? And also, if you're buying a high-end home, that means you're having a bigger amount of skin in the game. I mean, I encourage people, look for paint and carpets in the hottest part of the market, which is normally priced just below the median. Yeah. That's where you can, they're affordable. So you have a bigger pool of buyers. If you get something that's paint and carpet, you know, not a structural disaster, it's easier to clean up. The pen, pennies on the dollar to fix up paint and carpet along with landscape you know, can add a lot of value, especially if you got into the property right. Try to get into the property right with cosmetic repairs uh, at price below the medium. Don't start a high-end one or yeah. super tough neighborhood because it's super cheap. You know, that's where you get into trouble. And just remember, if you're like, as you said before, Jonathan, gosh, this is kind of boring. 
I just changed out the floors and painted and Man. did the landscape. And I only made $20,000 in yeah. months. Right? That's and what you want. Yeah. That's what you want. So, so boring is good. Price below the median is good. Cosmetic repairs opposed to structural yeah. uh, are, 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 are the way to go.